So good morning, everybody. My name is Emmanuel Brunet-Jailly. I am um, a professor at the University of Victoria uh, in British Columbia. And as is customary here, I would like to acknowledge and respect the Lankwangan people on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wassanak people whose historical relation with the land continues to this day. And I would like to say that I feel very privileged as a settler to speak from unceded Songhees land. Now, it's a delight to be able to present and to um, uh, um, talk about this new book by um, my colleagues, a book that is discussing borders, that is discussing culture. And um, I would like to say just a few things about um, the context within which this book came together. Um, this uh, text on borders, culture, and globalization, um, which has been edited by Victor Conrad and Melissa Kelly, uh, looks at how culture, in a way, makes and unmakes and undoes um, the traditional West Balian boundary line. It's um, a text, in my mind, that um, really demonstrates um, the plurality and multifaceted um, agency of cultures across borderlands. And it's a text that, in a way, um, illustrates how borders and cultures are in motion and continually, in a way, challenging the West Balian line, continually um, rebuilding also, in a way, um, borders of all kind. And uh, with this very brief introduction, I am very pleased to uh, hand over the floor um, uh, to Lara Menvio. Thank you very much. Merci, Professor Uh Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. And I would like to um, pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of the land on which is uh, located the University of Ottawa and the press. We acknowledge the longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. Nous rendons également hommage à tous les peuples autochtones qui habitent Ottawa, qu'ils soient de la région ou d'ailleurs au Canada. I am the director of the University of Ottawa Press, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today in such wonderful company to launch the 1,266th 66th uh, University of Ottawa Press publication, Borders, Culture and Globalization, a Canadian perspective by professors uh, edited, uh, er, sorry, by professors uh, Victor Conrad from Carleton University and Melissa Kelly from uh, uni uh, the Ryerson University. Uh, this title was published in May 2021 in our Politics and Public Policy series as part of a fruitful collaboration between our press and the Shirk funded Borders and Globalization Research Group, which is uh, headed by Professor Brunet Jay. Our press is particularly proud to offer uh, these titles as they fit perfectly within our publishing program. Um, we attempt to publish titles that are uh, that a that provide uh, excellence in scholarship as well as publishing practices and uh, that includes sustainable open access and um, <clears throat> that are based that engage with uh, today's issues for a knowledge-based globalized world so um, the borders uh, in globalization titles are you know perfectly fit within our publications program and I would like to thank uh, the fine folks at, uh, at the group for working uh, with the press. I'd like to congratulate uh, Professors Conrad and Kelly for uh, bringing together the stellar team of experts and and producing such a fine book. Also, thank you to my team at the press who works diligently um, with our authors to make uh, the research and the manuscript shine as best as they can. And thank you uh, to our funders, the University of Ottawa, of course, 
the Government of Canada, Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Can Council, as well as SHRC and the Federation of Humanities and Social Sciences, who enable our press to publish and promote the important research that is being done on our campus and beyond. So, congratulations. Et maintenant, je vous présente les auteurs et uh, le professeur, uh, Monsieur Brunet Jay. So, uh, good morning again. Um, so, this book um, has been in the works for about uh, at least a few years. <laughs> I was going to say seven years. I don't know if Melissa and Victor will agree with me, uh, but it's been a, a, a work in the works uh, since the beginning of the Borders and Globalization Research Program, which um, has been in a way co-led both by the University of Victoria and Carleton University and uh, Victor and I basically co-led that program. The culture aspect of this program, of this research program was one of six. It was a fundamental aspect and it was uh, one of the lens of analysis that we used to basically look at transformation in uh, borders uh, and more specifically the transformation of the Westphalian boundary line in the 21st century. We looked at history and culture, we looked at trade and migration, we looked at security, we looked at governance, we looked at sustainability issues, every time looking at how these manifestations transform borders and transform bordering. Um, to, so today we're really just looking at culture and we are, um, um, you know, uh, discussing this with Victor, Melissa, and Lee Rotney, and we are, um, so I'm going to introduce them very briefly. Um, um, so Victor Conrad is probably one of the pillar scholar in Canada when somebody thinks about border research. Victor has been in the field for over 40 years. He was the editor of a number of series. He was also at one point, uh, the creator of the Fulbright program in Canada. And he has published massively uh, in border studies. He has published in different areas, but really he is extremely well known, just in, not just in Canada, but worldwide for his contribution to the field of culture. Melissa Kelly, who is now a professor um, at Ryerson University, a research fellow at Ryerson University, um, has worked with us as a postdoctoral student. She had already done a couple of postdoctoral students in different uh, postdoctoral fellowships in different areas. And we were delighted to be able to work with her for our interest um, in issues of culture and migration. Um, and today, my understanding is that at Ryerson, she's you know, doing much more research in this area. She's a very active young scholar and her contribution to the book, I think is wonderful. And Lee Rotney is a well-established scholar at the, at the University of Windsor. And my understanding is that Lee has done um, a lot of work that is in a way, um, at least in my mind, uh, breakthrough research in border studies because she looks at very original forms of um, and vision and understanding um, of, um, of culture and how culture straddles borders. She looks at uh, visualization, she looks at uh, different manifestation in arts and so on and so forth, which is wonderful. And so I don't wanna to take too much time, but I think it's their, their turn now to present the book. Um, Victor is gonna do a more thorough introduction of the book, and then we'll have Lee uh, discussing the first part of the book, and we'll have Melissa discussing the second part of the book. So the first part, of the book discussed by Lee is viewing border culture. And you'll see that what I was discussing about her research here is really fascinating. Melissa will look at border and culture in motion. So looking at you know, mobility issues, uh, the transformation and the, the, what straddles the border in a way in culture and in a way is a, is a challenge to the boundary line. And then uh, the third person coming back in a way is Victor again, who will be talking about how um, indigenous perspective are also a very important lens to understand at least North American borders, but also I would say American borders, borders 
across the American continent in, in many parts of the world where colonialism has had a tremendous impact on the, inf the enforcement of boundary lines and how today all of this is basically uh, challenged by local culture and, and transnational culture. So with this uh, short introduction, I'm delighted to hand over the floor to Victor Conway. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel. I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciated the, uh, the University of uh, Ottawa Press uh, projecting the, uh, the book. Uh, here it is. It does physically exist. And we certainly appreciate uh, re receiving the, uh, the copies of it. What I will do, as Emmanuel has just pointed out, I will say a few words in introduction to the book, uh, introduction and some, some conclusions. And then uh, I, I will also make some comments on uh, indigenous borders, but I'll do that after, uh, as Emmanuel had pointed out, I'll do it after Lee and Melissa make their uh, comments. Uh, it's, it's just going to be very brief. In uh, 2008, Heather Nickel and I wrote that border culture is about encoding the meaning of the border. Since then, I've worked on decoding this meaning through research in many areas, most notably in Southeast Asia, Europe, and of course, in North America, where I have done a lot of work on the Canada-US border. In the book, In Borders, Culture, and Globalization, Melissa Kelly and I assembled 12 chapters representing aspects of border culture and added an introduction and conclusions to situate the studies in theory and in the context of the Canada-US border. In an integrated yet divided world, the interplay of cultures and borders needs to be disaggregated. It needs to be scaled, differentiated in order to ascertain and frame the key processes in bordering culture. And our book is very much about these processes. The prominent processes, certainly among them, are cultural integration and disintegration, the shift beyond indigeneity, the extension of cultural continuity. And in order to approach these processes and the manifestations of borders in globalization that develop from them, we have divided our book into three sections. Viewing border culture, and Lee will talk about that. Borders and culture in motion, Melissa will speak to that. And then I'll say a few words about placing and replacing border culture right at the, uh, at the end. The Borders and Globalization Project, as Emmanuel has pointed out, has a number of very important themes and culture is among those. Now, culture isn't always represented as a key theme related to borders. That is one aspect of the Borders and Globalization Project that is uh, somewhat unique and uh, groundbreaking, we think. Also, what we've done in the Borders and Globalization Project is to look at culture, <clears throat> not only from the scholarly perspective, but also from the scholar practitioner interface, looking at the policy implications of this work. Now, why, why border culture? Is it the soft side of border studies? It's often been indicated as such. I disagree with that, obviously, but uh, uh, those comments have, uh, have been made in the past. No, it isn't. Border culture is intertwined and integral to understanding border security, cross-border trade, and particularly border politics. In fact, I'm just working on a major project now in which we're looking at the politics of border culture. In North America, Canadian multiculturalism is at odds with American identity and exceptionalism. That alone is an important reason to study the culture of the border between Canada and the United States. Border culture emerges through the intersection 
an engagement of imagination, of affinity, and of identity. This production of culture is most evident and materialized in what we call borderland, the regions adjacent to and including the border. Borders and culture do not intuitively occupy the same space, however. Culture is integrative of space, and borders are limits of territory and edges of space. But these ideas have evolved tremendously in globalization, and that was one of the major reasons why we revisited culture and examined culture carefully in the context of globalization. From our perspective, border culture theory engages with confluence, with differentiation, with moving beyond these binary explanations of borders, and particularly engaging motion and looking at shifting interfaces. In globalization, border culture is in motion and in process, with anchors uprooted from territorial legacies and traditional spaces and places, familiar coordinates that are blurred or lost, many more cultural entities and affiliations intertwined, and novel associations and alignments apparent in spaces of integration and contestation. Border culture then is shifting in and out of focus. It's differentiating Canadian virtue from American excess. At least that's our perspective here in Canada. And it's transforming. It's hugely transforming. Border culture is multidimensional. It's in relational motion. It's increasingly a-territorial, as Emmanuel has pointed out in a number of his publications. There are strong implications for policy. And this is, again, something that we have tried to contribute in our book in addition to uh, what uh, uh, we deal with as scholars. The implications for policy deal with multiple stakeholders, subjective dimensions, plural boundaries, and the need to accommodate others in our evaluation. And it's this uh, th that I will leave you with, this sense of dealing with the other, reestablishing a sense of what the other is and how we can incorporate it more effectively in Canadian society. So I'll leave it at this point and pass it over to uh, uh, to uh, Lee. Um, thank you, Victor, and thank you, Emmanuel, for the really generous introduction. Um, it's been a real pleasure to participate over the years in the Borders and Globalization Project, and um, I'm really grateful to Melissa and Victor for inviting me and my colleagues from Windsor and Detroit uh, into the project. Um, with this uh, publication. So it's it's a real pleasure to be here and to speak about this. Um, so my uh, chapter, Sight and Sight on the Line, the Cultural Imaginary of Borderlands in North America came from ideas that I articulated more fully in my 2017 book, Looking Beyond Borderlines, which focused on shifting representations of um, the US-Mexico border and the Canada-US border over the last century and a half. So my chapter, as well as the others in section one, really uh, pick up on the idea of differentiation that Victor Conrad and Melissa Kelly draw out um, in their introduction, um, and especially the idea of diffused and complicated, uh, sorry, complicated identities that are produced at and near borders. Um, and section one is really um, focused on the Windsor and Detroit borderlands, which I think are you know, quite arguably the most urbanized uh, borderlands in along the Canada-US border, um, meaning that uh, the, the two cities are really contiguous and divided um, by that line that goes down the Detroit River. So um, it's, it's really a series of case uh, borderlands case studies, I, I would kind of, you know, think of it as. Um, and uh, the two projects that I discuss quite fully within my chapter, uh, both involve my colleague, Michael Dara, um, and my colleague Shermoy Mitra. Um, the first uh, project where I really went into some of these uh, questions is um, uh, uh, a kind of mobile exhibition <clears throat> that was called the Border Bookmobile, which was a mobile archive of maps and ephemera 
um, that were about this border region, um, as well as others in North America um, and more globally. So this project, as well as um, Shermoy Mitra's uh, uh, Border Cultures project, were really about trying to um, generate discussion around the Windsor-Detroit border in relationship to uh, the shifts that were happening uh, in the post 9-11 era, as well as the introduction of passport regulations um, in 2009, which really changed the, the kind of relationship between the two cities. So um, that was a project that um, wrapped up in 2013. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the work that we were doing at that point in time was in conversation um, with movement within art and media worlds uh, where social and relational practices were taking place in and around borders. So Windsor, Detroit, but also a lot of material on the US-Mexico border that you may be familiar with. Um, and I think in all of these projects, no matter where they were situated, um, they were really focused on the idea of framing borderlands as um, what we might call sites of dissenses. So this uh, borrows a term from the political philosopher Jacques Rancière, who de defined dissenses in opposition to the idea of consensus. Um, and the idea of consensus in his estimation tends to kind of paper over complexity. So when we're talking about a, a border concept like a, um, a national border, which, which puts things into, um, into differentiation or into opposition in a certain way, um, that, that moment of consensus um, papers over the, the, um, the kind of texture of the borderlands. Um, dissensus, by contrast, um, and again, this is in his estimation, um, holds open or makes space for complexity, um, complication, contradiction, and all of the you know interesting material around histories of migration, which are, are kind of erased when you're simply looking at that that picture of the border. Um, so there's a real focus on collaborative and discursive practices um, in this period, and I would define that roughly between 2010 and, and even the present. Um, where um, there was a real um, attempt to try and keep these ideas at the forefront um, at, at the same time that the border was, was becoming less and less easy to cross and to the point right now where we're, we're unable to cross. Um, <clears throat> and then the second project uh, that I discuss um, in, the, in the essay, but also this um, <clears throat> involves Michael Dara quite uh, closely as well, um, is called Buoyant Cartographies, um, Alternative Mapping Processes of the Detroit River. Um, and that project was really a series of three um, shoreline tours, um, walking tours uh, on both sides, both banks of the river, as well as uh, Pesh Island, which is on un unceded territory. Um, and it's in the middle of the D Detroit River. So the emphasis was, was trying to understand the Detroit River um, as a kind of vital point of connection within the Great Lakes system rather than the dividing line between the two nation states. And, um, uh, sorry, excuse me here. Um, the, the emphasis was really um, influenced by the Anishinaabe orientation of the, the Great, sorry, of the, the Detroit River as a vital conduit that runs roughly east to west, sorry, west to east, um, rather than the sort of north-south um, orientation of the Canada-US border. So um, we did a series of three walking tours, um, and those uh, walking tours were influenced by this um, notion of strata walking and strata mapping, which is a, a process that colleagues of mine um, in Hamilton have developed. Um, they're participatory uh, conversational tours where people are asked to take um, a specific strata, be it the wind or smells or, or looking at surveillance apparatuses or, or the sort of observational thing, casual observations that you can make on a, a kind of walking scale. Um, and it really um, involves being keenly aware of surroundings and noting um, the sensing or fleeting and the temporal connections that um, um, obviously are, are not part of the picture or the map of, of, of the border <clears throat> um, as a place. So um, we did this over a period of three days, uh, took lots of, lots of documentation, and then we formed a combined map, um, putting together all the strata, the various strata. And um, that was a, a media project that was uh, turned into a film and exhibited at the Art Gallery of Windsor in an exhibition called the Living, Ri Living River Project that was um, in 2019. Um, and then we're still working on getting the documentation onto um, our website, but uh, we do have um, some of that on frontierfiles.org. Um, and then there's a, a, a kind of comprehensive website around the border cultures exhibitions as well, if anyone is interested in, in um, 
following up on any of that, but it is discussed quite uh, fully and robustly within the first section of the, the Border Cultures um, volume. So I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, my colleagues' work um, if there are any at the end. So thank you. Now the floor is for Melissa Kelly. Melissa, the floor is yours. You need to unmute, Melissa. My apologies. You'd think I'd be used to this by now. Uh, hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you all for coming. And thank you to the University of Ottawa Press for organizing this great event. I'd also like to thank Victor and Lee for delivering such insightful presentations, and also Emmanuel for chairing today's event and for supporting us through this project from beginning to end. While I have the great privilege of being co-editor of this book, I am also the author of one of the empirical chapters in it, The Snowbirds, A Cultural Movement Across Borders. And it is on this chapter that I will present today. The chapter is part of section two, borders and culture in motion, where as Victor said, our goal has been to illustrate how borders are constantly in motion at and beyond the line and the need for new understandings of borders that capture this motion. In my chapter, I aim to do this by focusing specifically on the snowbird phenomenon. According to the Canadian Snowbird Association, snowbirds are Canadians over the age of 55 who travel to another destination for at least one month a year, although many go for much longer periods of time. Snowbirds typically go someplace warm during the winter months, returning to Canada for the spring and summer. The United States, as you might expect, is the most popular destination for Canadian snowbirds, leading hundreds of thousands of Canadian retirees to cross the Canada-US border each year. Most go straight down from the province they were reside in to the nearest warm place. Florida is the most popular destination, attracting Canadians from Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes in large numbers. Because many snowbirds go to the same destination year after year, and many own properties in their southern destinations. They are not quite residents, but they are not really guests either. Rather, they occupy a status in between. This ambiguous status becomes very, became very evident during the pandemic, as debates raged around whether Canadian snowbirds should be allowed to travel to their southern homes in the United States, and if they did go, whether they should have the right to get vaccinated during their time in the United States. And I'm sure you've seen some of these debates being discussed in the media this past winter. In order to understand the unique positioning of snowbirds, I think it's helpful to view the snowbird phenomenon from within the broader context of mobilities that have been enabled by globalization. The increasing ease with which people can overcome distance has disrupted the seemingly natural link between belonging and geography. The snowbirds have engaged in new forms of community building that are based on elective belonging and face-to-face -face interaction rather than belonging based on citizenship or long-standing ties to a place. Interestingly, however, snowbird communities have been built by people of a similar demographic, Americans and Canadians who are typically white, middle-class and over 55, who share similar aspirations and lifestyle preferences for retirement. When it came to my research, I was primarily interested in understanding what kind of culture is drawn upon and produced when Americans and Canadians come together in idealized lifestyle communities. I conducted interviews with Canadian snow snowbirds living in six Anglophone communities in Southern Florida, because this is primarily where Americans and Canadians could be found living side by side, in contrast, of course, to Francophone communities, which are primarily home to French Canadian residents exclusively. My findings illustrate how snowbird communities may transcend, recreate and reinforce existing borders. Relatedly, the study of snowbird communities provides an interesting empirical case from which to understand how borders have been rescaled in the context of globalization. Based on the findings of my study, American and Canadian residents came together in snowbird communities because of what they have in common. There is clearly a critical mass of people on both sides of the border with an interest and even a need to form idealized retirement lifestyle communities that encourage high levels of activity and sociability. 
the snowbird lifestyle offers a welcome alternative to aging in one's home community, an option that was typically associated, according to my study participants, with social isolation, depression, and gradual physical decline. In this sense, snowbird communities have come into being because of cultural similarities on both sides of the border. But in coming together, American and Canadian snowbirds have also developed a new culture. According to the participants in my study, community residents were expected to engage in volunteer uh, social activities and sometimes even fundraising events while they were present in their Floridian communities. Furthermore, in order to create community cohesion, certain topics of conversation were unofficially avoided, such as politics and religion. Importantly, the communities they formed and the culture they created were based not on year-round living, but on the seasonal migration of both American and Canadian retirees to the same sites. Through the development of translocal migration patterns and ties, the snowbirds living in the communities under study produced a new culture in localized spaces that transcended the Canada-US border. The communities Americans and Canadians create are not representative of mainstream society, of course. And for the most part, snowbird communities are segregated from the larger towns and cities within which they are located. Study participants mentioned that they seldom left their communities as they were typically too busy or they did not see the need. In fact, most preferred to spend their time on site in a space which they regarded as safe and enjoyable and where they could spend their time with people with whom they identified. So while snowbird communities are inclusive in some respects, for example, by bridging different nationalities, they are exclusive in other ways. Their formation therefore creates new borders to belonging. These borders manifest physically in the form of gated communities and high levels of community security, but more importantly, they manifest psychologically as the study participants had a very clear sense of who belonged and who did not in their respective communities in Southern Florida. The study participants generally had a strong sense of belonging to their Floridian communities and cited the face-to-face -face interaction, the active lifestyle and the care and attention that they gave to one another as key factors that made the snowbird lifestyle so appealing. Many said they would have happily replicated this lifestyle in Canada if possible. And in this sense, their communities could have been anywhere although most did mention that they would prefer to live somewhere with warm weather. One might think that after spending months in the United States that Canadian snowbirds may start to identify less with Canada. Somewhat surprisingly, my study found that this could not be further from the case. Despite spending so much time in the United States, the Canadian participants remain staunchly Canadian in their orientation and plan to eventually return to Canada as they became less active. If anything, their Canadian identities were strengthened on account of spending so much time in the United States. In particular, they cited Canada's welfare system and universal medical coverage as something to be proud of. Hence, while the border was transcended through the formation of elective communities, the notion of a border between Canada and the United States was at the same time reinforced. I believe my chapter is one of the first to explore snowbirds from a border studies perspective. But as I hope I've illustrated, snowbirds and the formation of snowbird communities have much to teach us about the relationship between borders and culture under conditions of globalization. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. I also want to add that uh, uh, it's been a real joy working with you on this project, and uh, and I think uh, uh, now that we've got the book in our hands, we can we can see the result of uh, all of these years of of, of effort. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for your uh, contribution. I'm just going to very briefly because I want to make sure that we have time for for questions and discussion and so on. Uh, just a very brief overview of uh, placing and replacing border culture, this focus on indigenous borders, which constitutes not only the final uh, part of the book, but uh, the theme of indigeneity is something that runs throughout the entire book. And it's also something that is a common thread 
throughout the entire por uh, Borders and Globalization project. Uh, there are a number of uh, other cultural studies that have been done related to borders and globalization, which are not in this book because they've been published in other contexts. Uh, for example, in British Columbia, there uh, has been a, uh, uh, a, a journal, uh, an entire uh, issue of a journal that's been devoted uh, to uh, uh, British Columbia, and it focuses very predominantly on, on border culture. And then uh, we, we have other facets of this as well within the overall project. So that's uh, one aspect that, uh, that I just wanted to touch on. We, we have three studies that are very specifically ind indigenous encounters with borders. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the studies are also complemented by a final fourth chapter in this section, which deals with planning and managing transport cultural heritage landscapes, which also include uh, indigenous uh, landscapes. So just very briefly, I just want to introduce the, uh, the, the four uh, chapters in this final section. Evelyn uh, Myers chapter, uh, which is a uh, perspective from uh, uh, Canadian literature uh, on Thomas King's artistic activism. It examines indigenous voices in figurative borderlands, settings of diverse cultural expressions, border representations, and identity negotiation. Very uh, nice piece of work. Uh, Evelyn is currently in Germany, uh, where she works uh, uh, at an institution in, uh, in Bavaria, in uh, uh, southern Germany. Uh, Letitia Rouvier, who is in France and was the first postdoc on our Borders and Globalization project, uh, before uh, Melissa joined us. Uh, Letitia did a fair amount of work on the uh, site of Aquasasani, the cross-border uh, indigenous presence in Aquasasani, which has a American component and a Canadian component. And uh, she looked at indigenous sovereignty and national security as a reflection or an illustration of how Mohawk culture borders space, place, and habitation, and how the Mohawk have been very effective in working the border. Not their border, our border. And I think that's a, that's a fascinating uh, uh, presentation. Then Heidi Weigand and Colin Howell from the East Coast, uh, who participated in the project, uh, they, focus on sport and bordering the Haudenosaunee, which is the uh, name that the Iroquois have for themselves. And uh, this particular study shows how sport is an integral part of the bordering process and a place for staging disputes involving national identity and sovereignty. They're looking particularly at the case of the, uh, of the lacrosse team, the, uh, the famous Cana uh, Canadian indigenous uh, Audenasani lacrosse team that was not allowed to leave North America because they didn't have uh, traditional passports. And then finally, uh, Scott Caffarella, Joel Conrad, and Rebecca Sierra, who are all cultural and natural heritage specialists in government and the private sector, embracing the associative cultural landscape assessment and management model to show us how indigenous heritage is integral to a holistic approach in capturing and conveying border culture. In other words, this is co border culture in operation, not just in motion and not just in theory, but in actual operation. And this work epitomizes the partnership ethos that the Borders and Globalization Project promoted between the academic sector and the non-academic sector. And in that way, it's a very fitting final chapter within our book. Thank you very much. So maybe now we can take questions and comments, but before we start, I just want to tell everybody um, uh, in the participants uh, that uh, right now the, there is a 20% discount 
and that you can access it in the chat. And that, you know, it's a nice way to look at the book is to actually get a discount on it and then read it. Uh, especially if you think that what we have uh, told you about the book is particularly interesting. Now, if you want, um, uh, the, the easiest way is to write uh, questions in the chat. And that way, all of us here can uh, see them and we'll be able to answer them in turns. And uh, because I don't see any questions, Victor, I, if I may, actually, I, there is one in the question and answer box, which is by Mohamed Humran. Does Canada and the US come together to solve issues regarding maritime borders? Maybe this is a question for you, Victor. A little out of my league, but uh... Uh, I wish uh, Heather Nickel was here. Actually, she's uh, she's done a lot more work on on that aspect of it. Uh, but yes, clearly there there are uh, maritime issues in which Canada plays a very important role, and uh, some of those uh, issues actually involve some very interesting uh, cultural sidebars. Uh, one of these is uh, with regard to to Hans Island in the uh in the uh arctic in the the strait between uh, baffin island and uh and greenland there's a small rock which uh which occupies uh the border space and uh, it is a place that's been uh contested between uh, the danes who uh uh, are responsible for Greenland, uh, and have jurisdiction, and uh, the Canadians. And there's been an agreement to disagree, as there often is in many of these kinds of disputes uh, involving maritime territories. And uh, in, in, in this particular instance, the solution was a very cultural solution. And that cultural solution is for the, the Danes to drop off a bottle of, of uh, Danish brandy on the site when they visited, and uh, for the uh, uh, for the Canadians to drop off a bottle of you guessed it Canadian rye whiskey on the spot when they visited, and as a result of that, they've come up with a, a cultural solution to a political problem. Victor, because I don't see any questions, I want to ask you all three what you think. Uh, is the major contribution uh, the book is doing to the field of border studies. And I think that, you know, each of the sections have a message in a way for the audience in terms of what is the contribution of the book. And Victor, more specifically to you, uh, uh, the book in my mind is a major contribution of the, you know, borders in globalization research program. Um, and so I wanted to ask you if you think uh, that uh, we have made our mark, or if you think that, you know, how you think we have made our mark in a way in uh, border studies today with this with this text specifically. I know that you're working on an a research agenda. You're still very active on this research agenda that has to do with the role of you know studying culture across basically the West Badian border borderline. Um, uh, but, uh, and you were saying the politics of culture, obviously, in borders is a, is a very important aspect. But so how is this book basically contributing to borders and globalization and the agenda that we had drafted now um, eight and a half years ago? That's a, that's an excellent question. And it's also a very, very difficult question to, to, uh, to respond to, given the fact that culture is so pervasive and so 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 broad, and it's a very very difficult thing to pin down. I've been working on aspects of border culture interpretation for many years now, and the more I work on it, the more I find that we really have not come to grips with this this very difficult thing to define. And I think uh, I'm almost coming to the to the perspective that 
trying to pin it down is not where we should be going. Trying to understand it based upon the way in which it emerges in various ways and the way it makes us appreciate it. In other words, the art of border culture is what we should be comprehending. That's where we get our greatest sense of discovery and our greatest sense of understanding of border culture. So to, to define it in social science terminology, to put it into specific border uh, uh, theory uh, allocations of, uh, of, of theory, you know, that, that sort of thing. I, I think that, that uh, it's, it's not that it's not productive, it is productive and it is important for us, but it's not going to accomplish the final goal of really understanding border culture. And what, uh, 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 I don't know if, uh, if Lee and Melissa agree with this, but my sense is that our greatest uh, thrill that comes to us when we're doing work on border culture is getting to recognize artistically what border culture really is and how it can convey that to us. So, so that's, uh, that's one aspect of this book that I think we have, uh, we have been successful with because we have focused on that throughout. Um, so the, a, a major contribution, I think, of the book to, to try to put this in a, in a succinct form is to point in the direction of a number of things that are important for us to understand with regard to border culture, but not to say this is the succinct definition of border culture. In other words, leave it out there for a while. Uh, allow other people to grapple with various components of this and take that and move it along. Uh, because we, we have introduced a number of different facets here. Um, we have introduced uh, a lot of the, the idea of border culture becoming and uh, in motion and so on. So that is important. We've introduced a territoriality. We've introduced a number of other dimensions that are also significant in understanding border studies in a broader context. But in all of these instances, we're saying, here, take this, look at it, see what you can do with it. But we're not being prescriptive. We're not saying that this is the final word in uh, border culture studies. I hope that makes sense. Um, I'll just jump in with some. Yeah, Lee, please go ahead. Thank you. Some really old observations about the. I think when 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 we talk about art, we often think about it as something with like a capital A. Um, but that distinction that was made many years ago by Ray, Raymond Williams, um, <clears throat> I think the, the small C culture, the kind of everyday production of, of idiosyncratic behaviors and, and that, that sort of thing is just as, as rich in terms of being attentive to when you're looking at border culture. So, you know, I, that kind of dovetails with the shifting nature of it, but also not to be, I mean, this is, I think borderlands historically have been seen as um, kind of remnant spaces and, and not the spaces where the, the real national cultures take place. They've always been peripheral. So you have to be attentive in different ways, I think. Um, so I just wanted to add that gloss onto the idea of, of what we might think of as art. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting art that's currently being produced in different borderland spaces. But at the same time, I think borderlands become interesting um, on, a, on a very kind of mundane um, everyday level as well. So to, not to lose sight of that, that small C culture within that. Well, I think that's a really important comment too. Melissa, do you want to have a few comments? I think it's uh, it's hard to talk those answers. Those have been very thorough, thank you. So one of the things that I think about when we when I read the book and when we're discussing, you know, culture, big C, small C, is that um, we are looking at culture uh, from, you know, major um, scholarly paradigm. There are people who talk about um, the role of uh, local actors, 
the role of and the role of agency in challenging the boundary line. And there are people who look at and you know I'm thinking, for instance, about um, um, Deleuze and Guettari on one side that are much more Kantian in their view, uh, you know, of what is going on across the border. But on the other side, we also have, uh, you know, individuals like uh, Giddens or, um, you know, or Lefebvre, for instance, or Manuel Castel, for instance, who have different views of how culture in a way can be really structuring and how it in a way strengthen the boundary line. And so I kind of want to go in there. Where do you locate your work? Maybe Victor or Lee, if you feel like it, please jump in and tell me. If I had to choose uh, <laughs> from the list, I would probably say um, uh, De Soto or Lefebvre uh, in terms of, you know, really um, digging into the idea that space is, is socially produced. Um, that's been a huge uh, influence uh, in terms of my perspective. And I think Rob Shields wrote a long time ago on that that um, way of trying to mitigate this, this tendency to see the, the binary at the border. So, uh, hmm. um, but I mean, there, there are also lots of other um, scholars. I mean, I think um, Mazadra and Nelson have been a, a real uh, touch point for, for many people. And I believe they're coming more from, certainly from a continental perspective um, on that. So um, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what, how other people answer that question. Melissa, I have a question for you in the chat. What, I, it comes from Randy Widis. What kind of association and practices do you, do Canadian snowbirds establish to maintain connections among themselves while living in their Floridian communities? And to what extent do these associations and practices include and or exclude neighboring Americans? Well, thanks, Randy, for the question. I think it's a, a really good one and an interesting one. Um, I did discover that a lot of these communities had Canadian clubs, which did help to bring Canadian residents together. But it was always emphasized to me that these clubs were not exclusive. They were definitely open to Americans as well. Um, but uh, they did create a social community within the wider snowbird communities where uh, people could come together and celebrate things like, you know, Canadian events and holidays and so on. Um, but on a more informal level, I didn't have time to mention in my presentation that there's a lot of chain migration within snowbird communities. So a lot of snowbirds already know people when they move to a snowbird community from their home communities in Canada. So there's already these established networks in the community. And uh, this gives people sort of an added sense of belonging as well, because they have friends even it, within communities, even prior to moving to them in general. So it was important to a number of the snowbirds to keep those networks alive. And they will also wanted, interestingly, to keep the balance of Canadians and Americans healthy in these communities. In other words, they didn't want to be outnumbered by Americans. So as much as they emphasized that it didn't really matter where people came from and so on, they did like the idea of the communities being a balance of Americans and Canadians. And I think part of the reason for that was because it was very important to keep the temporal aspect of the communities alive. In other words, Americans could move to these communities and stay there year round versus Canadians could not. So by having more Canadians come to the community, it kept this active temporal snowbird lifestyle alive, which was considered very important to the residents. Sorry for the long response. No, that was a great response. Thank you so much. I have another question, I think, uh, for all of you to a certain extent from Mohamed Humran. Does modern technology and communication reduce the importance of border? We see internet cover all areas and um, you know borders. Could you could we look for another way to stop? Um, I don't understand actually. So how how I, 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 the 
the wording is bizarre. To stop harming sovereignty, sovereign borders, such by the media and satellite. If that makes any sense. Victor? What, one of the uh, one of the papers in the book, one of the chapters in the book, deals with uh, new internet regions that are being produced, re cu cultural regions that are being produced uh, through uh, internet usage. And this is just one example of the, the kinds of new cultures that come from uh, internet use and, uh, and, and, and the efforts made by people to communicate uh, more uh, effectively uh, through new technologies. And uh, uh, my point would be to respond to that question uh, is, is that uh, the, uh, the culture that comes from the new technologies is potentially, and we don't know enough about this yet because it's just being studied at this point, but that culture is manifesting in many different ways that traditional cultures did not, did not manifest. And, uh, and as a result of that, uh, what we decided to, it was to put this chapter in the book, but it's an enticement. Again, just like a lot of our other chapters, it's an invitation toward further research, toward uh, trying to gain a better sense of what's happening. We are right in the midst of that massive global change and uh, how it's going to play out uh, remains to be seen. In some instances, what happens is culture is diffused. In other instances, new cultures are developed. In other instances, uh, who knows what's, what's happening? But this is certainly an area that needs uh, a lot of exploration. And I think, Lee, uh, you want to contribute to that, the first part of the question. Please take the yeah, I mean, I, I think Michael Darrow might be here as well, but and I'm really building on some of his research on, on Marshall McLuhan. So this is going, this is not looking at, you know, really new media, but um, McLuhan was quite interested in looking at the borderline as this interval of resonance, a kind of relays that can kind of go back and forth, um, you know, with, with the borderline in, in place. So he saw it as a kind of instrument to reverberate um, ideas back and forth. So that was a metaphor that he, he used quite extensively. And I think Mike can say a lot more uh, or speak more articulately to, to the question. But I, I, I found that in looking at some instances of, of media culture on the Canada-US border in, in Windsor in around 2006 or seven, um, there was a, a highly contentious uh, billboard that went up for a few days um, and the, on the Windsor side of the border. And this kind of had made headlines around the world. Um, and it was um, in response to the uh, Lebanese civil war. Um, and uh, th this was an instance where um, media, international media or kind of global media um, amplified the space of the border um, rather than, than transcending it, for example. Um, so I think it really depends on the, on the situation uh, as Victor mentioned, so. And I think with this, we are really at the end uh, of our uh, presentation uh, of this book. We've uh, circled the whole hour. And so I want to thank you all for um, attending this uh, book launch. And I want to thank the different questions. And obviously, I want to con congratulate uh, my colleagues, um, Melissa Kelly, Lee Rotney, and Victor Conrad. I want to thank you, um, the University of Ottawa Press, Lara Menville. Thank you so very much for supporting our research program. And uh, to tell you that this research is going on, that obviously, as Victor said extremely well, and I think it echoed in Lee's and Mesa's talk also, it's, um, a, this book is a first step. It's allowing us to approach and to look at, you know, the uh, culture challenge to the West Valley line, but the research has to go on for us to understand what is really and how things are evolving today. Certainly the book illustrates the 
our multiplicity and the multi scatter parts of culture and the role of agency across uh, these, uh, uh, these boundary lines. And I really like to close by saying, you know, there is such things as the big C culture and small C culture and the daily activities of small C culture, obviously across the boundary lines, across the Canada US boundary line um, is really a very important aspect of future research. So thanks again and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.